On TV Concierge, The Ringer staff delivers a guide to the vast streaming landscape by discussing one show or movie per day, including premieres, the latest surprise Netflix hits, periodic check-ins on favorite TV shows, new movies available for streaming, and the host's favorite shows to watch right away. Check out TV Concierge exclusively on Spotify. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line, it's the Horse Whisperer. It's Andy Greenwald! (laughs) The problem with Horse Whispering is you have to get close to the horse to really effectively whisper and then bad things can happen. No, Chris, you You, joke. Is this going to be your apology? Are you apologizing to the equine community? Not at all. I mean, first of all, I can't be blamed for this. It wasn't my idea to force all 10th graders to read Equus like my high school did. That leaves a mark. Um, no, I, we're going to talk about Top Chef today. Yeah. You're going to love it. It's not really just going to be this. But I do want to say the beauty of doing this podcast, I mean, there are many things, seeing your smiling face twice a week over Zoom, chief among them. But when I was telling a long story about how I was afraid that horses were becoming uh, aroused around my young family. <laughs> you really do um, need to re- recap it. You, I, well, maybe people missed the first show in the week. And now because they'll go they back. turned off the podcast when you yeah, were here. <laughs> but Chris, you correctly crowdsourced. And you were like, I'm sure that in our deep and diverse listenership, there are at least a couple riders of Rohan. Uh-huh. And they will weigh in and tell you that you're wrong. And guess what? They did. Thank you. Thank you so much to the greater riding community. Yeah. Um, you know, apparently horses are just randy creatures and they love a good time. So um, in that respect, they're not different than any Top Chef contestant. Did, did you I have wrap any, that in a bow? Did you have any headlines you wanted to talk about before we got to Top Chef? I mean, there was this Phoebe Waller version news that she's joining the cast of Indiana Jones 5, uh, directed by and written by James Mangold. Uh, so she will be... I don't know the the capacity that she's going to be joining in in terms of like whether or not she is being set up to be the next Indiana Jones, which would be quite something, or if she's just in it. Uh, So so there was that was like sort of the big news that came out before we went on. Um, But other than that, I hadn't really. Is it? Are there other examples of this, Chris? And first of all, we wish. I mean, I'll speak for myself. Uh, I assume you agree with me. Like, I wish Phoebe Waller Bridge nothing but enormous success. I think it would be pretty weird if I did, but. (laughs) <laughs> it would be odd, <laughs> yeah, but I do like, want to say, is it, is there, are there other examples of this where when I see the news, my brain corrects the headline to what I want it to read, which is Phoebe Waller-Bridge to write the fifth Indiana Jones movie for James Mangold to direct, and then maybe also be in it, but I get really excited because It's my only I, concern troll about all of this stuff. I, this yes. is just so much good shit happening for Phoebe Waller-Bridge. She's in Mr. and Mrs. Smith with Donald Glover on Amazon. She's uh, rewriting doing a punch-up job on uh, No Time to Die, the Bond movie that's coming out at some point. She did, and, she did do it. She didn't. She, wouldn't it be she, amazing if she was doing a punch-up now after it's been in the can for a year? Who can say? You know that's what I true. mean? Like, I don't do, When is this movie really coming down? Yeah. Um, so she did a, a pass on, on No Time to Die. She's, she's doing Mr. and Mrs. Smith with Donald Glover. She is essentially like the movie star of the pandemic in the sense that mm-hmm. she has booked all these roles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and her, her sort of... Q rating has like exploded 
without actually being on screen. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And now she's doing uh, indie, which I'm very excited for. I the only thing the only concern troll is like I I kind of would love to see another written and directed by or written by Phoebe Waller Bridge original, but I think that's going to be the thing that you say about every single person who gets sucked up into this sort of franchise world of Hollywood right now. Well, it's interesting too. Like what I what I wish we could see and talk about, um, although that I guess that sounds sort of creepy and stalkery, is like I really am curious what Michaela Cole has been offered over the last year and what interests her, what she might take or not take. Because like Phoebe Waller-Bridge, she is a comet, right? Like it's the, the total package of creative auteur, um, brilliant, funny, smart, penetrating performer, director, writer, who, you know, uh, I May Destroy You wasn't necessarily the ratings champion of 2020, but among the cognoscenti or within the industry, certainly that was the number one show as it was for us on our podcast. And that's generally when the bigger offers come calling because people just want a a piece of it. And it, in this case, is the kind of the magic, ineffable magic that creators, really, really um, idiosyncratic creators can bring to a project. They just want some of it too. And I think that Phoebe Waller-Bridge has clearly given a lot of thought and navigating what choices make sense for her and what things she just wants to have fun with and try. Um, I'd be interesting to see what Michaela Cole announces next, whether she wants to go play in someone else's sandbox or whether it'll be another uh, original and yeah. announced in tandem with a completely original idea. So we're doing Top Chef today, uh, episode two of the Portland season, season 18. And we have a very special guest. We have Mina Kimes joining us today to chat about the show, to chat about her fandom of the show. Uh, great conversation with her. Anything else before we get into that, Andy? I mean, I, 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 I we, we're not prepared to do this, but just as we were <laughs> Chris's face when I say things like that, he loves it. Uh, just before we 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 started recording, I saw across the old industry transom. You know, I've got one of those old ticker tape things in, in my. You in my love saying here. transom. Yeah. I do love saying transom, but now I want it to be like one of those old like market things that was in like the glass cloche, you know, yes. and the paper comes out, and then the Hudsucker is Mr. Hudsucker is like, oh no, and Tim <laughs> Robbins invents the hula hoop. Yeah. Um, that Apple is making a TV series out of Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, which is the bizarre like i was actually in the cia and a spy memoir of the former gong show host chuck, chuck barris, barris. Yeah. but this was a much hyped movie project that had like went through a lot of directors and stars before being made as george clooney's directorial debut almost 20 years ago now mm-hmm. with sam rockwell in the lead and now it's being made with justin timberlake as the star and the tenor of the piece is just like apple was dying to lock down timberlake after this movie palmer and like this was the perfect like hot piece of ip and this is one of those ones where I just feel like we're going to see a lot more of this as companies are with, you know, I get it, strip mining their own uh, libraries just to be like, we got this. You want to do this? And if someone says yes, then it's an exciting thing. But it, is this as hot as they think this is? Like, I, I'm not saying it's not going to be a good show. It, we don't have, know anything about it. But the the breathlessness with which it was announced that like this kind of obscure property that's already been mostly done and not embraced once that kind of, I kind of noted that. Uh, let me answer your question with a question. Oh, that's that's a pro move. What's the, like, for instance, I will watch, yeah. I will pretty much watch any Winston Churchill movie. Like, oh. I, I'm never going to be like, I already saw this Winston Churchill movie. I don't need to see anymore. <laughs> Same thing with Hannibal Lecter. Uh, okay. And I'm not making any connection between the two people. I'm just saying, like, if they want to just keep making... Silence of the Lambs and Red Dragon and, and right. Man, like I'll be like, yeah, you know what? I bet I would love to see this other person's take on it. Chuck Barris is not on that list for me personally. You know what I mean? Right. Not a Gong he, Show he, guy. Not a not like I just don't. That's not my. He's vibe. not the 20th century's Lear. Like every actor needs to take a yeah. turn. So I, I guess my question to you would be: What is the what is the thing that you are most interested in? You will just watch a hundred versions of this person's life story or this character, and what is the one that you're just like cashed out on? Well, I think the thing that I will watch a hundred versions of is person travels Asia and eats food in street stalls. Like, I'll, 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 I don't care what it is. I don't care who it is. Like, I am, I am scraping the barrel of YouTube right now, just being like, oh, so that's what the Hokkaido night market looks like. That's how how desperate I am for that kind of content in my life. Always, I think. Um, what is the? T- I mean, I, I I don't know if I have an answer. I think that you know, we like, both of us like spy stuff. And so if it's, a, but that's a genre. No, that's I, a genre, man. I'm talking about like, um, I'm talking about like the character, like, or historical figures or something like that. Where right. you're just like, I don't care that I've seen this. 
Like, I also would probably be up for as many Cuban Missile Crisis movies as they wanted to make. Like, I just right. always find that, like, crisis, like, room, panic suite uh, vibe to be incredibly, like, engaging. So if they want to make, like, a bunch of movies about that stuff with the Kennedys, I'm always interested. But have you reached peak, we're going to put a man on the moon, goddammit? You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that was oh, yeah, your wheelhouse. Sure. But yeah. now maybe we've tapped out a little bit. Yeah, I think, like, I mean, apparently the 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 new season of For All Mankind is quite good. But I, I have probably... Uh, I've I've probably gotten enough astronaut lore. Can I? Uh, we we should. We're, we're this is just potpourri right now. I do feel like a lot of this. I, I'd love to think about that and get back to you and our listeners. I also would like to check in with For All Mankind at some point because, as you said, I've heard really good things about it, especially uh, in the second season. And I am I'm trying to dip in and 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 catch up. But I do think that there was kind of a disconnect potentially between what the show uh, seemed to be. Mm-hmm. What, how it started and where it ended up. Because I think it was pitched as, you know, the 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 space race and the Cold War uh, never really ended uh, because yeah, the Russians a, landed on the moon first. Alternate history right stuff, essentially, yeah. Yes, and but I was talking to a friend who also had been kind of on the fence about it and then uh, I think is dipping back in. And he was just like, I was confused because I looked at the posters and I thought it was like women in space. And then I read about it and I thought that the show was going to be guns on the moon. And mm-hmm. if the show was called Guns on the Moon, he was like, I would have DVR'd past it forever from day one. <laughs> but when you watch the pilot, which is beautifully made, um, it's basically like Chuck Yeager likes to drive fast and yeah. John Glenn doesn't swear. And like, we know, we know, <laughs> which is not a ding on any of that. No, right. it was the story they had to tell. They felt they had to but tell that's to my get point. to the story is they that, wanted like, to tell. I know that like Winston Churchill had sciatica and liked smoking cigars and being a little bit opaque in his, you know, like communication with his co- colleagues. But I will watch it over and over again. Um, Did you ever consider during early pandemic that that Churchill in the bunker would be your quarantine vibe? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Like, did you ever just try it out on your wife and just like start now smoking I'm about cigars? To go find out. Like, I think my new vibe is going to be Chuck. L- Chuck Yeager likes to drive fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's um, right. We should get to Mina. We should get to Top Chef. Uh, Greenwald. We will be back on Monday, uh, talking about uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier, and then you know next week we are sort of the, preparing the table for Mayor of East Town, which we're really excited about, and we are also at least next week we're going to be recording. Seasons one and two of the Bureau, uh, our, our recaps and our, our sort of big deep dives into that. So I think we'll probably wind up airing that at some point in the next two weeks. So first two seasons of the Bureau, I know a lot of people are watching. I know a lot of people have watched and are going back. We're really excited to do this. So that'll be uh, in the next like 15, 20 days, I guess, probably airing. Uh, so and, please- and, and I'm a little ahead. I'm, I think with Chris, I'm into the third season. Let me tell you it. It, it is not disappointing. It is yeah, really I, worth it. People. Yeah, I cannot wait. Um, so yeah, let's get into our conversation with Mina, Top Chefs episode two, and we'll see you guys on Monday. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Andy and I are back to do Top Chef. It's episode two, Portland, and we are joined by a very special guest this week. It's ESPN's Mina Kimes, also our friend Mina Kimes. Mina, what's up? Thank you. Thank you. I feel like I'm your friend first. Yeah, of course you are. And but, ESPN second. You know, and friendship is a big, um, <laughs> I feel like it's a big theme on this episode. So it's important because I feel like, for example, if Andy and I were on a team, we might perform yeah. better than if Chris and I were on a team because our friendship might get in the way of constructing the perfect dish. This is a huge issue on this show this week. I mean, I think that I was going to ask you guys as, because Mina, you're kind of like a top chef completist. You're a historian. You've been watching the show since its inception. Mm -hmm. And Andy as well. Do friends cook well on this show together? Because like when you form a click on this show, when when you Mm -hmm. get a little bit of a, a gang going, 
Does that all automatically mean you're going to cook well together? Or does that mean actually you're not holding each other enough accountable? Wow. Wow. Chris, you're starting with the heat rocks. I yeah. think it can go a number of ways. I think, you know, we're yeah. obviously going to talk a little bit more about the episode as a whole. But if we're going to skip right to the end, I think what did in the losing chef as part of the losing team was that they were far too respectful of each other and assumed that their natural life chemistry would lend itself to harmony on the plate. And then, of course, that was brilliantly good job, Magical Elves, contrasted with the uh, short rib watermelon dish, which yeah. was apparently a disaster of uh, uh, interpersonal uh, chefery, and yet worked. The it chemistry was, just was wrong, but the food was so good. It was, a, it was a good dish. I think the constant we see in season after season of Top Chef is someone just has to make a decision. You can be a jerk about it, or you can be supportive and encouraging of everyone, but someone has to make a key a decision about what the dish is going to be. You can't just sort of like meet in the middle, literally, of the plate. Yeah. Um, chef splaining, I think, was the what happened mm -hmm. uh, in the rib dish. But I, I, which I don't think is a term I've heard on Top Chef. I wrote it down. I, But, but <laughs> uh, so... I'm also watching this show with a first timer, our mutual friend, Chris, Chris and I are mutual friend, my <laughs> husband, Nick, who's been your friend for a long time and he's new to it. And so last week I was, um, you know, the second they did the sob story, I was like, he gone. And so my husband has been yeah. looking to me and asking, Oh, if they're fighting, does that mean they're going to go? And if they're getting along, he's asking me to sort of read the tea leaves. And I've been, I, and I had to explain to him, not really necessarily. Like there is quite a variety of outcomes, you know, sometimes you get the horrible breakup and sometimes you get Wonder Wall, like mm -hmm. Oasis, just making a sweet <laughs> jam, in this case, ribs and watermelon, but the tension doesn't get in the way. So, Mina, before we get into the specifics of the episode, I think that listeners of The Watch at this point know very well my entry point into Top Chef at the very beginning. They know very well Chris's entry point into Top Chef in a just blaze of glory last March and April. Could you talk a little bit about your fandom? You clearly, you've already said, you've watched all of it. What appeals to you about the show? Do you enter it for the competition, the reality aspects? Clearly not the sob stories. What has kept you watching? What draws you in year after year? So I've watched every season from yes. season one. Um, and, and when I was living in New York, I used to like, I remember being really excited to go to Perilla, Harold's restaurant. Yes, Perilla was really two. good. Great restaurant, yeah. And there were a lot of okay sometimes. There, yeah, there were a lot of good spots in New York, so I was excited about that because I liked eating out, and um, I also liked the fact that. So I watch a lot of reality television. I also watch a lot of dating shows, um, like The Bachelor. I watch Love Island UK when I exercise, and uh, Project Runway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I always liked Top Chef because of the not only the light touch on the reality aspects of it, which used to be a lot heavier and has gotten lighter and lighter and lighter as the quality of the contestants has improved, but also just the fact that like it is, you know, the expertise. I love kind of learning and watching people who are actually really good at what they do. Like there are so few TV shows out there where you can watch people who are just taught, masters of their craft, I guess. And I always liked that. Um, and you know, I, I, do, I just, it's a really well-made show. I mean, this particular episode, which we're going to talk about, like deals with some really pressing and serious issues right now and does it with such a light hand. And I can't think of that many shows that do that. Yeah. You know, I was going to ask you guys as people who have watched it for a really long time, because I obviously came in at all stars and then went backwards. But there's something about this season where they have all these all stars returning as judges, and it's a pretty it's a pretty big judges table. Like at the uh, the quick fire mm -hmm. challenge was like eight eight different judges, I believe. Because and like I thought they plates. were going to let each uh, dish go, and I was I like, know. are these dudes going to sit here for four and a half hours? <laughs> I know, but I almost feel like the the amount of judges and the the size of their personalities is somewhat overshadowing the actual contestants mm -hmm. this year. And I was curious whether you guys picked up on that at all, or whether that was just like me going into a season trying to get to know all of these new chefs. Hmm. I, it does have a little bit of the like save by the bell reboot, but the OG cast is around where yeah, if I yeah. was coming to that, I would be mm -hmm. drawn to, you know, Mario Lopez because I know Mario Lopez, who's I guess Samar <laughs> in this analogy that's very tortured. But yeah, I think there's just so many of them right now. You're kind of it's 
it's hard to distinguish them from the familiar cast of characters. Yeah, I this think happens that on every change. It's like this on Survivor. It's like when you get to those first two, two or three episodes, you're like just trying to remember everybody's name and kind of figure out like who you like and not. But when you compound that with, oh, that's Melissa. Oh, there's yeah. there's Dale Talde. Like you're kind of like distracted almost by the judging talent. And then when you get to the chefs, you're like, oh yeah, you guys, did you do anything with coffee? It's a twofold thing. I think the the legitimate things that you're talking about are, are they're just true. Like at the beginning of every season, it's a scrum. And every season with new contestants, you're like, I can't imagine ever falling in love with any of these 15 randos. And then by restaurant wars, you're like, I would die for that person. Yeah, right. Uh, let <laughs> totally. alone to go to their restaurant. So that always <laughs> happens. Um, and that said, it's also hard to come to the show after an all-star season, especially an all-star season like last one, where we already were in love with people and then we fell doubly in love with them. And then to your point, Chris, they're hanging around still. I think yeah. if I had two concern trolls on this particular topic, which I do. Do you concern elves in honor of the production company? I think oh, that's that would be really, good. Yeah. God, that's why you're the <laughs> that's why you're the best in the biz. Um one is that, and I say this with kindness and with love, um, I don't know if the Amars and Dales of the world have the judging table authority of past winners, necessarily. I like them both. I respect their taste. Talde, another great restaurant in New York that I frequented quite a bit. But they didn't win, you know? And wow. they're new at judging ta judges' table. So I kind of was digging the, like, the Melissa Gregory thing because they were just you know, fresh off this near championship run. So I was kind of ready for more of them. The other and Gregory's thing like seeing, the mayor of Portland. Basically, the other uh, him and Kyle McLaughlin co-mayors. The the but the but the other point concern that I had from all the judges, and I'm curious what you think about this, Mina, is Tom seems both marginalized and bemused this season. I think Tom mm -hmm. has had less screen time in two episodes than he's had in 18 seasons. Maybe he's fine with that because he's got to do Last Chance Kitchen or whatever. But every time they cut to him, he's just making that little magical elf face where he just thinks someone has said something kind of amusing that he disagrees with, but he's cool with it because again, it's season 18. Are we, yeah. are we losing Tom? That's a good question. Yeah, and his Fair Isle Portland shawl color, collared sweaters. Um, <laughs> I mean, we're really that. I, like loving the the clothing. By the way, of the judges, it's really like they clearly came into this knowing it was an opportunity to express themselves. Um, I agree about Tom. I think that typically, also, we're not really seeing him going into the kitchens and offering feedback yet. Mm -hmm. That part of the show, but again, there's just so many of them right now. It can be kind of hard to. Uh, judge at this moment. I think with the past winners, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gregory actually didn't. No, he didn't win. Won. Yeah, he just yeah, should have won. Right, a season. Correct. Which I also, by the way, feel the same way about Dale. Is and a Gregory won. had the back injury in the in the final, right? Do you think Dale yes, should have won Chicago in Italy? Um, I don't want to relitigate that. But I, I, think I, he, I, I know a girl and a goat who would disagree. <laughs> he's in that group. I would say that category. I mean, yeah. all of the, I would say with the exception of maybe like a Mar, like all of those, the all-stars are the ones we love and respect and whatnot. And I actually, God, watching, so I was watching the final, the elimination challenge judging whenever Gregory or Melissa praise something, especially Melissa, who's like very soft-spoken, mm -hmm. um, I really took it to heart. Like when she loved the mm -hmm. lobster dish from Shoda, I was like, that must be freaking good. Cause yeah. yes. they already have this authority. And so I don't feel bothered by it. Like, it's not like when you know, the worst top chef challenges, and they really don't do this that often would be when they would bring in just incredibly uneducated people or uneducated God, people who aren't food experts to judge. These people have, enough mm -hmm. authority to me where I really respect their opinions. And when Gregory or Melissa or who would have you left something, I was convinced. Mina, not to step on your ESPN expertise here, but what did you think when Melissa froze the defense by saying dim sum? <laughs> that was in, an incredible moment when no one moved. Nobody wanted any piece of that. I mean, what kind People of offensive player can out. do that? Yeah. I didn't, th I thought and this is probably my ignorance. I didn't think dim sum would be that hard, but that's because it's small. But I think it was that also but it's for her. because it's small. And you're making it for her. So she's just, she's not going to be yeah. like, oh, nice, nice college try. That's a good segue mm. to get into the actual episode and we can just jump right into the quick fire challenge, which I really enjoyed, even though I thought it was like very complicated in terms of its setup. Uh, it was basically that it was a diner challenge. So you had eight judges, judges called out their order, chefs rang the bell, to claim an order, two chefs per per order. 
facing off against one another. And then they were responsible for eight servings. And I think at one point someone broke it down and was like, this essentially means three minutes per dish that you're working on, which we saw come out on the other end. Several people were able to not, not able to finish plating their, their dishes. And, you know, so for example, Kwame asked for shrimp and grits. We, as we said, Melissa asked for dim sum. Carrie, of course, asked for toast. Uh, Amara asked for steak and eggs. And Richard Blaze had like a four part, um, like really elaborate, but I actually thought very true to the diner experience. Like, you know, I want a BLT, hold the B, replace it with A, then instead of mayo, I want like margarine, but m- like make sure the margarine is peppered kind of thing. A very elaborate order. And that, that's also, know, by the way, the order he places in the hair and makeup trailer, every day, <laughs> which I hope right. we can discuss. That's right. This. And uh, Jamie won. Jamie won with her shrimp and grits. And... What did you guys think of the, the the quick fire challenge? I actually, I mean, I really enjoy, obviously, diner food. Diner food is probably secretly the thing I've missed the most is going to a diner over this last year. Um, my typical diner order is is pretty straightforward. It's pancakes and scrambled eggs with bacon. Um, what do you guys, what's your go-to diner order? Wow. Chris, I remember when your go-to order was like the cheese eggs at that place in the back bay. Yeah, I, I thought know. that's what you were well, going to say. Like, that, was, that was like a culin- that was a delicacy. What was? I'm sorry to digress. What was the name of that place? Charlie's. Chris used to have this Charlie's, Charlie's. A spot yeah, in Mass Boston. Ave. And my favorite thing about it, in addition to the cheese eggs, was that there was a framed sign photo of the Boston rapper Tim Dog <laughs> on the wall. <laughs> and he, what he wrote on the picture was like, "Hey Charlie's, like thanks for the eggs. Fuck L. A. <laughs> right." <laughs> like that was his breakfast message to the people. Okay, I'm sorry, Mina. Please. I actually love, okay, so I'm not a Blaze person, um, but, uh, and and I think he probably, they came up with the idea of having the last one be, you know, mm-hmm. the most complicated, whatever, independent of him. But I love corned beef hash. I actually, it's like one of my favorite, ever since I was a child, um, it looks like dog food, but it's so good. Um, and the thing I would probably order the most is like the veggie hash and eggs, which I think both contestants didn't get the egg on it, Donna and Sasha. But yeah, yeah. Um, that's that was something the I second get a lot. time Dawn had missed the plate in two episodes. Ironic for a track star, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I would think that the athlete would be the one who is the most in, head in the game. But yeah, I, I uh, Chris, I feel like I have to represent for our place of birth and shout out getting Scrapple at a diner. Do you actually oh. like Scrapple though, like on on the reg? Um, I mean, there's two tier for people who don't know. Scrapple is just all the leftover meat cooked into a small <laughs> patty. Um, right. <laughs> I, let me try to make it sound more appetizing. <laughs> I think that uh, I think that there's two tiers of Scrapple because, of course, there's like chefy Scrapple at like restaurants in Philadelphia now, where they're like, "Oh yes, this is made with only the parts of the duck that you might have encountered other times in your life, not just the bill." Sure. But uh, there's also like the Lanark Diner Scrapple at like, you know, two in the morning. So yeah, I can mess with some scrap. We get egg on the side, some toast. <laughs> if you guys were going to do an elaborate order or a confusing order for these chefs, what do you think you would do to sort of throw a curveball here? Because for the most part, I think steak and eggs, <sighs> dim sum, the hashes, the toasts, those were all pretty straight up. I think Richard was the one who asked for like the more elaborate, like there are a couple of different components at a couple of different timings here. I think the timing thing is it. I think that from what I understand yeah. about the beautiful music of short order cookery, the eggs are what kills you. It's the yeah. easiest, but everyone's like, I want them over medium or I want them sunny side up or I want them, you know, hard or whatever. And so keeping track of that and not also just keeping track of having them where they are when you take them off the heat versus where they'll be on the dish or not on the dish as was the case often last night. I think that's probably the trickiest way you can get in people's heads. Yeah, I think they all tried to be fair on the egg front, not ask for frittatas or soufflés <laughs> or poached eggs, just because with respect to the timing, you know, every egg dish was just an over easy egg, which again, I don't think like the goal shouldn't be to, well, it depends what you want. Do you want speed and and um, the short order cooking skills or do you want mm-hmm. the chefs to express themselves, right? right? Like what are you actually interested in? Yeah, as a judge, I mean, Jamie, who won, did a, I think she's gochujang in the grits mm-hmm. with the shrimp, if I remember correctly. Jamie, our little BB-8 contestant. <laughs> um, are, we, are we pro Jamie or Jamie, I, I, for those I, who I, is the onomatopoeia? Yeah, I, um, I warmed up to Jamie spouting. by the end of, C, of episode two for, I, and we could just talk about, I can mention this now because it was the first even hint of gameplay. Um, was when she was paired with Kiki in the elimination challenge, which we will get to. But she went to Kiki and she was like, 
I have immunity, so if we're in the bottom, I'm gonna I'll take blame for whatever goes wrong with the dish. And I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. I mean it was like and also it was like that's how you form bonds with people. That's how you kind of like develop like kind of a, 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 a like a rapport with someone. Obviously, we've talked about whether or not that actually serves you in the kitchen. But if there's ever a point where other chefs are judging her work or talking about her or picking her to come help them out later on, like Jamie's building up a pretty cool resume. So I, while I was like slightly annoyed by some of the pew pew stuff, <laughs> by the end of episode two, I was like, I like, I like, I like this lady. I, I also think it's indicative of like the, whatever era we're in now of Top Chef. It's not just last week, Chris, we talked a lot about like the decline of, well, there was a time at the beginning of the show. I mean, I, you, I'm sure remember this as well, where like everyone was Gabe from Portland. They were just yes. all aggro dudes like that. And that was not just like the, the standard contestant. It was definitely the standard expectation for the winner would behave like that. And I'm kind of into this new era where people can be like Sarah, who's just like, I'm happy to be here. This reminds me of my high school bong rips, but it tastes amazing. <laughs> also yogurt and Jamie, you know, yeah, who's 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 cosplaying in a galaxy far, far away half the time, but also can deliver. And I feel like that's that's important. Uh, it makes for good I, television, but it's also I relate to her so hard because so much of the time when I'm trying to do NFL evaluations, I resort to sound effects, like <laughs> trying to describe an offensive lineman in the draft. I'm Panay Sewell, for example, I was like, you know, he was like, Rawr! And like that doesn't literally that means nothing. I'm like, Rawr! Um, especially with quarterbacks, the pew pew is that's a, uh, you know, Alex Smith pew pew. Um, <laughs> but back to Gabe, Gabe and Gabriel really wish that wasn't a thing, but yeah, Gabe is the aggro. Gabriel is the dude from Texas. And, yeah. and what's funny is they're, they're PDX and ATX, right? They're literally the two cities that often just trade for each other. Yeah. They just, uh, they just swap tattoos for each yeah. other. And <laughs> they're small market teams that, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think both of them also are front runners, which are leaders, which, which again is very concerning, not because I despise you to them, but because they're names. So it's just uh -huh. as of you are really <laughs> annoying. Um, but speaking of what you said, Andy, like Gabe, you're right. Gabe is very OG top chef, but I think in seasons past, that sort of archetype of a guy would be a lot more aggressive. Like I actually see him mm. holding back even in yes. the conflict with um, Don where he didn't want her to season her ribs. It's a little bit on the nose, but um she was like, you're bossing me. He's like, no, we're bossing each other. Like he, he was clearly trying not to be that guy and trying right. to resist his like, you know, chef explaining tendencies. And I think there is a level of understanding and mutual respect between all the chefs and the cultures that is very different from seasons yes. when people would be like, the I, Asian guy keeps cooking Asian food. You know, I, what right. the fudge? I agree with this. Gabe from Portland had big HR meeting energy at that moment. <laughs> You know, he's like, he's, we're he's, all friends here, the right? The wheels are spinning. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's already seen the interviews and the commentary. Um, before we get fully into the elimination challenge, I just wanted to ask you guys about some of the, the the social aspect of the game, which we've already touched on in terms of the relationships that were forming. And obviously, Brittany and Sasha had a friendship that was eventually their downfall. Um, Jesus, but, isn't that like us? You know, I think we remarked last week, and I was curious, Mina, whether you would notice this. This is not a critique of anybody's personality on the show, because I genuinely generally really like the chefs this year, but everybody seems kind of on edge. You know what I mean? Like it is very much a product of the times that we were living in. And like, like somebody mentioned the week before, I think the episode before that they were like, I haven't really done any cooking in six months. Like I've only been cooking yeah. for myself. And Sasha this week was like, man, like I haven't really interacted with people since March. And, you know, I think that you can kind of feel that in the vibes. Also the fact that essentially they're going to, a kitchen and then going back to this empty Kimpton yes. and uh, uh, hanging out. Also, but like not also really Sasha like did her post whatever interviews in a bathroom, yeah. which I thought maybe was a tell <laughs> that she wasn't around for a long time, but please continue. Yeah. So I just thought it was, I thought it was worth noting, you know, that there have obviously been and er earlier seasons were much more contentious and seemed a lot more like alphas, like trying to like out outsmart each other or whatever when they were at the house. But this especially, especially coming off of, LA and and Louisville and Charleston and some of the other seasons more recently feels a little bit more like like everybody's holding the wheel a little tight in this hotel. Do you guys see that? Yeah, I think there's a blend of gratitude and also um fear because when you're eliminated, you're not a lot of these guys aren't going back to bustling businesses. Yeah. Um we saw that with again the stories from Shoda who is like crushing it, right? But told us two of his restaurants closed. 
I can't imagine being in a competition and having that in the back of my mind, knowing this, the economic stakes are different for a lot of these chefs who are very accomplished. Like Tom is, I think, made a point of pointing mm-hmm. out this might be the most accomplished group which is again, a product of the circumstances. They're available <laughs> for the show. Mm-hmm. Probably guys who wouldn't be like, they are dropping restaurant names like 11 Acid Park and Shea Panisse, like all over the place. And yeah, see, seeing Roscoe Hazel there, I was like, all. who's minding the pit at Rodney Scott's, man? <laughs> like, are you guys? <laughs> and what, it wasn't gone long, poor Roscoe. But um, yeah, I think that's real. And I also think like, again, this speaks to what I love about this show. Like the... Um, experience there being voice is something that I think is really universal right now. Like granted, we're not executive chefs at four star restaurants, but what Sasha said, like, I'm not sure how to talk to people at yeah. this yeah. moment. Yeah. God, I felt that. I mean, geez, Louise. I, I think it's, yeah, I think it's worth noting that they had a very fine line to walk just on a production level because they shot this last fall. And mm-hmm. that was a very, that was like six eras of American life ago. Right. And the chefs themselves weren't the only people who were feeling the tension of, and and the whiplash of two weeks ago, I was quarantining in my house with no business. And now I'm palling around with new friends and performing for a TV show. Everyone involved in the production was away in their lives. And now yeah. they're all quarantining together. And the tension of that, and also just of making a show in this era and getting tested and what's going to happen and what does it mean? It definitely had to affect the production. And I, and I think they also weren't sure of what world they would be releasing it into. And would it seem too glib or overly protective or, you know, getting it, getting that tone right. And so we're feeling that. The LA season was aired as I believe, as we were going into lockdown, as we were really grappling with the reality of all this. And it almost was achingly nostalgic because it was LA restaurants that some of us have been to and were want to go to and, and seeing the city, like as the three of us live out here. And now this season is airing at a time where, gosh, if you think back to the last fall, it's like, that was the no hope zone. Like we were really like, guys, like this might never, never end, you know? And that was it. So now to watch that with a little bit of, of light at the end of the tunnel is, is pretty, pretty interesting. Do you guys remember watching last season and being like, Gregory and Nini are so excited about going to the trolls world tour premiere. But it will never happen. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh yeah, my we'll God. They never. got to go to a virtual zoom. <laughs> Oh God, that was like a color challenge. But but yeah, I I think this season is going to be such a fascinating time capsule, like in years, because they really, it it is just such a moment. And in the way that the tone of last season was rather escapist, I think for many of us watching at home, there's nothing escapist about this season. It is a mirror right now. Like they, I mean, it is a mirror where people cook a lot better than me, but it is a mirror. And um, I f- I'm feeling different watching the show. And you guys also would know this much more than I would, but it's not like the, like last season of baseball, which was shortened and weird and no fans. Like there aren't going to be asterisks next to it. It happened, but it, everybody knows that it was weird. And that's kind of what this season is going to be. I, I'm, the thing I'm most curious to see how they execute is, is Restaurant Wars, because that's the thing that I think involves a lot. It, it, in its baked into its concept requires a lot of like logistics and so, okay, who's doing front of the house in Restaurant Wars? Is it going to be Restaurant who's Wars? Coming? Yeah, who's, who's coming? coming? Who are they talking to? Are they doing it? Are they going to make Restaurant Wars curbside pickup? Like, I, I don't even know. Like, that's, that's oh. the, the one that I'm really like, how are idea. they going to make that work? So we could talk a little bit about the elimination challenge if you want. But Andy, did you want, do you have another thing? Well, this is kind of a segue because this is actually about what the elimination challenge was about. So... I, just to recap it, it was going to be some of the people were making coffee dishes and some of the people were making beer dishes. And then, whoa, twist. Here comes Tom with that beautiful, what do you call that kind of scoop neck? It's a shawl collar. Yeah. Shawl collar. Yeah. Tom. I mean, maybe also the outfits are good because they never have to go outside. So they don't need to have like <laughs> alternates yeah. or all weather options. It's true. Anyway, uh, it says there every dish has to combine both of those things. And my first thought was, okay, it's, it's fun. It's definitely challenging. As we heard many, many times last night, bitter notes could begin to emerge. Um, something we all felt over the last year, certainly in our own lives. But the, 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 the first level of concern, again, that I have here was, are we burning through Portland cliches too quickly? Because we had birds last Ooh, week. We have coffee and yeah. beer this week. And yeah. my concern is that this is because the reason this we're, the reason it's happening, but also maybe the reason I'm feeling this way is because we cannot actually go into Portland. One of the beauties of the show being in different cities is not just like every LA challenge wasn't Trolls World Tour challenge. It was also 
oh, here's here are the actual restaurants that feed the actual people who live here. And it might be illuminating to people who don't spend a lot of time in L.A. about what L.A. also has or Louisville also has. For Portland, they can't go anywhere. And so they're really hammering down on all of our biggest Fred Armisen and Carrie Brownstein cliches of the area. And then Including they just Fred serve Armisen it to people sitting Brownstein, in a closed room. Who are going to be on the We're show coming. Yeah. Apparently the only people who are available to attend. So we're not getting a Damian Lillard challenge? Because I've done... I, I I want I want a a Damon CJ challenge like I I want like a what what's what feed our backcourt challenge. No, what, what would that cha- what would that challenge be that a chef has to prepare an entire dish in thirty seconds? Like what is the yeah what Dame is time? the Dame Dame time? time? Yeah, the, the oh, end of I yeah, like that idea. last two minutes. Uh, but but Mina, as a as a Pacific Northwesterner, uh, well yeah, <laughs> what generally well, uh, not yeah. the same city, but like what do you yeah. get a sense? of place-ish? Or do, would you like more of a sense of place? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a miss. But you know what? I think back to a lot of cities, uh, the show, like the LA, whatever. It, I don't feel it's super essential um, in some cities, frankly, as it is in like the Louisville one. I actually felt a lot more acutely. Um, I also, in the preview, they showed them, I think the next week is they're going to like African West African restaurants. Mm -hmm. So I suspect they're going to be going to empty restaurants and empty locations and it'll be missing in a way. Um, but they'll be able to capture some things about the city. Um, yeah, there just probably won't be a scavenger. It doesn't bother me too much. Chris is the Portland guy in the bus. Yeah, Chris, what, what, what Portland cliches do you want? What do you, Well, I'll be completely honest with you guys. I mean, like there's a bunch of restaurants there that have closed this over the last 12 months. So, I mean, there, there's a few places that I would love to see them check out, but I don't even know if they're open at the time that they're filming it. And that was going to be probably any city that they shoot in outside of Florida or Texas. So, I mean, I don't mm. really know what the uh, what what they could have done about that. But I think that that's what we're going to miss is like some of the places that I, I think... I mean, I don't even know if Gregory's Restaurant is open. Uh, it became well. It never opened. It was supposed to open in 2020, mm. and then he converted. So, it, but it didn't open. So instead, he converted it into like a pop up winter con winter garden where he got, got a bunch of yurts. Uh, so it has been operating over the last few months, but it it was not on track. Okay. But Chris, I do like the idea. I do think that there was someone in the magical elves planning meeting over Zoom OVS. It was just like, well, it's finally time to do the Orlando season because Bubba Gump <laughs> Shrimp right. Company is open and ready for customers and business. And like, that's where we're going to, we're just going to go to where the action You just see like Ron DeSantis being like, welcome to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the elimination challenge. Did you guys have, was there any pairings where when you saw the two people together, you were like, uh-oh? Well, I think we talked mm. briefly about Dawn and Portland Gabe. Yeah, as, but, as but, but wound up making great food. But was there any? I because I, I actually thought when Sasha and Brittany were like, we're mm. best friends, and we can't be stopped. And in fact, our mm. our cycle, like our te- telepathic link, is so strong that we're just going to combine our recipes rather yeah. than coming up with a new one or deferring to one flavor profile. I was like, this is trouble. Like they were they were telegraphing that these two were like too into each other to be paying attention to the food. They were getting the overconfident edit for sure. And, but I think what you just said that again, they, they really pound, like they really drove home the combination of the recipes rather than the creation of a new independent recipe. And it speaks to, it, it wasn't the friendship that undid them. It was the process, right? Which is, um, how did we build this dish? Mm-hmm. I actually thought I was worried for Shoda, our guy, who's probably mm-hmm. number yeah, one draft Avatar, pick right, right now. Yeah. Yeah. So no, before I was worried because when they were doing their independent recipes and he had beer and he was like, I don't like beer. And he's like, I'm going to kind of hide the beer. And I, from my couch, I said, no, because whenever yeah. there's a challenge and a chef <laughs> is like, I'm going to minimize this thing. I don't yeah. actually mm-hmm. like to work with, you know, that they're, they're headed for a bad place, but Avishar comeback story, by the way, for, for our science, science oriented man, uh, who I really like, um, he kind of actually brought him back. And I think that was a great example of how like, okay, actually working with someone, combining a new dish, doesn't really matter who it is or what they're, how good they are, how close of a friend you are. It, it all comes down to the dish and are we b- making something creative and new together? 
I agree with that. I I will say though, I I think it there was an element of friendship that did screw up um uh, Brittany and Sasha. And the moment for me that that is seared in my mind is when Brittany said, So what color is the sauce gonna be? And Sasha was like, orange. And Brittany was like, Oh. No, she was like, that goes great, great with these. She's with like, these that's great, right? Yeah, yeah, but there was a little bit of like a I, I support you in your tone. choices. You yeah, you like that outfit looks great. Like there was a little bit of like but the problem was, is that Brittany was like, don't you think this needs more vinaigrette? And Sasha was like, no way. This is just you perfect. You would never need more vinaigrette. Yeah. Bestie. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, th- um, I really love the Abishar thing, too, because I thought, you know, there have been past seasons where, candidly, there might be a couple of people who are a little bit out of their... They're punching above their weight class by being on Top Chef. Like maybe they're just not ready for this level of competition or this level of cooking. And I was worried about Abishar after the first episode and a half maybe in that regard like he was a really cool character but i was like can this guy cook on this level and he brought the exact thing to show i mean shoto doesn't need a ton of help winning but the carbonated grapes is like a fun weird curveball that i don't know that shoto ever would have hit on out of like a hundred times making that dish and i was just like let's try this i can make this because i have like this bachelor in science and i thought that was like a really nice combo of 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 uh of chefs is that his nickname, Bachelor with Science? Bachelor like with Science. Bachelor I feel like that's, that's, psychology. And I was like, wait, that's not yeah. science. But yeah. I'm like, did I write this down wrong? I don't know. But I love that they leaned into his nerdiness. I like him. He seems super down to earth and fun and self-effacing. When he went up against Shoda in the quick fire, it was like, this dude made freaking mochi in like 30 yeah. seconds. You know, I, I I fell in love with him. But like every, every single one of these um, pairings, like the relationship really mattered. And how that relationship influenced the process, whether it was, you know, the Nelson and Maria. Oh my God. Did you guys that was uh, very get emotional when I she, love Spanish, that. Yeah. when she talked about how speaking Spanish, it's like you have to pee and then you get to be, I, I'm, I love Maria. I'm yeah, really I like, in on I love her. Maria too. And you know, they didn't win, but it was incredibly charming. Whereas um, Byron and Chris who made the pasta that was Chris made the pasta mm-hmm. that had too much flour, you know, Byron was, getting steamrolled a little bit and they were showing a lot of, you know, him saying like, I don't know about this. And that combination of personalities clearly led to the demise of the dish in some ways. Just to, if we jump to the winner's circle, I did want to say uh, two things. One about the, the, the Shoda and Abishar pairing. We are in a, that dish is in rarefied air for Top Chef because generally, and I feel like you guys will agree with me on this, um, you can tell when something is a winner and you can tell maybe by using the outer limits of your taste buds imagination, you can imagine what it tastes like, like the ribs and watermelon. I've never had sour beer, compressed watermelon, but you can kind of imagine, okay, rich meat, well-cooked pickly thing. I get it. I'd have no idea what Shoda and Avatar's dish tasted like. No. I had no idea if it was going to be a winner or a loser because he kept saying double cream Sunamono, which are not words that go together <laughs> in any sentence. But it reminds me of like Paul from the Texas season or uh, Mei Lin or M- Melissa at her most Baroque, where I'm like, they're operating on a different creative plane. And that's probably something that we've never had before. And it's it's a it's a home run shot, right? It's either going to win or or it's not. And so that's that's uh, definitely something to watch. The other one I was going to mention while we're in the winner's circle was Austin, Gabe and Sarah, because that just looked perfect. The, the like, beer everything tortilla. about that, they were just stunting. Like a beer flavored tortilla, which was the fifth extra thing on the perfectly composed plate. Like, I can't believe that didn't win, first of all. But second, that was a real like, uh, we're, we're, we're laying down a marker here. Sarah is a perfect example of a contestant who eight seasons ago actually would have been overestimated or underestimated part of me and this season she's like no i don't know how i'm winning nobody's see- I, I, I don't mean that in a mean way but <laughs> no, she's but- doing a little bit of the taylor swift thing yeah like uh-huh. oh me Again? but like no one's buying it everyone's yeah. like yeah that that woman's a, a savage she's gonna fucking kill us with yeah. like rustic is no longer a you know bad word on top chef and like mm-hmm. simple farm whatever she, her thing which is very different from shoda and maybe the gabe and gabriel's no one is uh 
unaware of how good Sarah is. She definitely, yogurt is becoming to her what toast was to carry though. Like someone, like Padma yeah. already brought it up, like yogurt again, you love yogurt. Like it's going to come up where somebody's just like, oh, what a surprise, Sarah put like a, a smoky yogurt on something and they loved it. You know, like that, that PD, will come, PDX that game. Will yeah. <laughs> that's so yeah. But, but that's <laughs> it. I would, PDX game. I prefer a top chef where someone is like side eyeing smoky yogurt than being like, why is the chef of Mexican heritage making tortillas? Which, as right. Nina pointed out earlier, like that was the dominant strain of 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 uh, intramural fighting and sniping for 10 years. That was Vegas, right? I mean, it, it, their versions of that kept yeah. kept happening. It's, right? There's so many examples, especially with uh, Asian chefs. I mean, that yeah. was something I was always very um like attuned to early on in top chef some really great chefs you know and um yeah it like they used to say it out loud it's crazy and now it's obviously very different so i'll just say uh i don't know if anybody has gotten a chance i hope people have got a chance to watch last chance kitchen again andy just want to mention you know i don't know if you saw it M muted tom i thought like tom's always a little bit like warmer in last chance kitchen i think than when he's is on the mothership show but i thought he didn't have like the usual kind of like verbose and, and like very personal like touch. He was just sort of like, you're doing stuff. I love to see it. Or maybe I don't. And then would walk away and people made their food. Uh, but I mean, I don't want I don't want to mind read Tom, but I think it's worth noting that he's even busy before we knew they were filming. Yeah. yeah, they were filming a season of Top Chef. He was one of the most vocal uh, proponents of the Independent Restaurant Coalition. Like he was out there basically being like, my business is over, but I can afford it. Like this entire industry is decimated unless I personally do something about this and I'm going to be on Cap Capitol Hill and meeting with senators and I'm SNBC. And part of him, and also then he like he got a new puppy, I learned from, I think, <laughs> from Instagram. So I feel like <laughs> in the middle of this to be like, oh, but also you have to do your day job and quarantine in Portland for 10 weeks and be like, this sauce is too thin. At a certain point, maybe he was feeling the strain. Yeah, I have no idea. But like, I mean, uh, Sasha beat Roscoe in Last Chance Kitchen. Um despite making, I think, another crumble on top of her dish, which I guess is like both, it's it's her, it's, it's she just can't leave it alone. You know what I mean? M Mina, we didn't have you last week. Can you, can you just lay a little tribute track to Roscoe here? Because I feel like 18 <laughs> seasons, generally the first person eliminated isn't the one you most want to hang out with for 15 weeks. It oh almost God. never is. It's Literally the most a... interesting man that's ever been on Top Chef. Um, I agree. Uh, look, what a renaissance man um roscoe the musician the artist the cook the just generally lovely person and, and i will say it is interesting that they did back-to-back -back sad stories likable people uh getting eliminated in episodes one and two because i found sasha to be immensely likable yeah. mm -hmm. super funny and you know kind of cracking on and and her story was emotional about getting sober during covid and um Again, I had to, so I had to turn to my husband. I had to say, like, just because they show this doesn't mean they're going. It's just been the case. Episodes one and two. Um, we'll see what happens after this. But yeah, Roscoe, God, I'll miss him. I wish there was like a Bachelor in Paradise for Top <laughs> Chef where I could just watch him hang out. And I wish he could just fun. immediately become like a, a commentator. Like, I don't even necessarily need Roscoe to be a judge, but just somebody who's like kind of comes in for 30 seconds and does kind of a life update. But also, you know, they're not, as as you guys have both already alluded to, they're not going anywhere. I mean, they never go anywhere. When you are on Top Chef, you are you have to hang out for all four to six weeks or however long it takes. So they so there are no spoilers. You just, like, are hanging out in Last so Chance Kitchen or a different part of the hotel. So just in a different part of that Kimpton for six weeks? I'm not sure about <laughs> this. This year, they might not. I, this yeah, year, yeah, I don't once know they're eliminated that's... from LCK, <laughs> I think that's right. He's just However, like... in, in All Stars, usually they get a different contract and they can leave I'm reading all of the needed. Kate Atkinson novels by myself in Portland. <laughs> because I can't get the fuck out of here. Well, no one is in Powell's. It's closed. Maybe he <laughs> yeah. just got the keys. Yeah, yeah. But 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 this is my point. Like, couldn't he just hang out in the Kimpton, like in the stew room and just He's like got offer three advice? Kids. Can and... you just hang out? <laughs> Chris, I would volunteer to go to the Kimpton <laughs> to hang out because of my children. You are misreading the situation wildly. <laughs> wildly. <laughs> The thing, the yeah. calculation you could see in all the chefs with kids' heads in that in that moment when they're having their 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 Terlato wine or whatever it is this season, early on in the premiere, they're like, yeah, I've got a couple of kids and I'm here. They were like, and I told my wife it's good for the brand or like I'm contributing to our family <laughs> as long as I'm competing. Yeah. Can you imagine the call home or whatever? Be like, yeah, I'm still in it, but they're actually just hanging out in the indoor pool. Yeah, it's 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 a mess. It's a mess.
can't imagine that's the case. I don't know. I'm speaking out of turn, but I can't imagine in, in, in a pandemic, they're just keeping them around. But what if they ask to stay around? Okay, well. What if they ask? Ask. <laughs> Roscoe just as well leave. Roscoe's like, do you know what time I have to wake up? Did you hear me? <laughs> it's draft season, so let's do our big board here. Uh, Mina. I, I feel like you, you, like you said, Shoda seems like you're Trevor Lawrence right now. Who do you have like in second or third in terms of, of favorites right now? Sarah. Sarah? Sarah is, yeah, I'm trying to think of, you said Trevor Lawrence. She's not really Zach Wilson. Cause, well, she did kind of <laughs> rise up the board. Sarah's more like a Trey Lance. Yeah. God, half of the people listening to this are like <laughs> so upset right now. Yeah, the other One third of the people on the podcast <laughs> yeah. are out of it right now. <laughs> We should we go back to the Blazers thing because I thought of some really fun Trailblazers <laughs> challenges. I could play that one. You know, shooting from distance, kind of uh, competing mm-hmm. against more stacked teams. Like one team's a Laker, the Super Team, and um, yeah, Sarah I think is number two for me. Okay, Andy, what about you? Do you think showed a number one? Yeah, I think. Well, I think Sarah is still number one until Shoda unseats her. But I think because she's been out of the four judged competitions she's won three of them so i feel or, or been in the finals you know of she of, she's been in the winner's circle i think every time in right? the winner's circle right. right she didn't win last night but she won the first two in the pilot and then she was in the clearly in the number two position last night yeah um but i think she and shoda are the top tier and then and then that's kind of a scrum to stand out i think texas gabe really laid a marker down last night um i'm still i i was pretty shook because last week i i i said i still like dawn I, I refuse to sell my Dawn stock. The she egg, did a lot that of was, screen time. That's right. Getting a lot of screen time. Compelling personality. Um, Philly. Has some issues at the the finish line. Like, has some issues finishing, like a lot of Philadelphia teams. <laughs> so maybe that's why we like her. I like Dawn. Uh, I, I, I agree I love with you guys, that she though. kept the pepper. And uh, yeah. it, they kind of just dropped it. The yeah. pepper is the Ben Simmons of the dish, and she refused <laughs> to trade it. And you know what? It worked. It worked, Gabe. Uh. Portland Gabe. I can't think of a better way to end than that, the, Mina. Thank the pepper you so should much. shoot more, though, Mina. I think that's the issue. <laughs> well, you know, the pepper might be using the wrong hand. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Mina, what's happening right now. hopefully you'll be joining us a couple other times this season to talk this Anytime. this season. I'd love to. Thank you so much for j- jumping on. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>